Hello, everyone, and welcome to our weekly cyber threat intelligence briefing. Today is September 11th, and in today's briefing, we'll be covering the most recent trends that our threat intelligence team is witnessing in the trenches. Uh, my name is Keith Wojcik, Global Head of Threat Intelligence. This week, we're joined by Associate Managing Director Lori Iacono, Senior Vice President George Glass, Vice President Dave Truman, Vice President Mikesh Nagar from our cyber threat intelligence team. Uh, we'll be covering the following trends that we're concentrating on. Uh, the Cisco vulnerability, iPhone vulnerabilities, blister malware, uh, chase malware, and the ransomware roundup. So with that, I'm going to turn over to George to discuss the Cisco vulnerability. George? Thank you very much, Keith. Um, this is a uh, sort of a developing topic, um, so we'll probably have more um, in the, the week ahead. Um, but uh, the the team at Cisco has uh, released some information about a zero day vulnerability affecting both um, ASA and FTA. The vulnerability is um, essentially a, a way of uh, brute forcing um, valid uh, credentials uh, out of a, um, a Cisco ASA or um, FTA, uh, FTD uh, uh, appliance. Um, so CVE 2023-20269 only has a CVSS score of 5.0, um, but it is being successfully exploited in the wild to deliver ransomware. Um, we're trying to gather more information on this um, as we speak. Um, but for right now, what we do know is that uh, Cisco does not currently have um, patches in place for this. They'll be releasing those soon. Um, and right now they have a number of mitigations posted on their blog, um, the link to which is in the weekly report. Um, one important note about this brute forcing um, is that it does not allow a bypass of any sort of multi-factor authentication. So wherever possible, um, as we always do, we recommend that's enabled for all users um, immediately. Um, and we'll continue to monitor this and uh, hopefully have some more information uh, for next week's briefing. Moving on with some more vulnerabilities. Um, last week, uh, Apple provided uh, an uh, emergency uh, update for two zero-click zero day vulnerabilities um, exploited to attack iPhones. So the SCUDI update was issued for CVE 2023 41064 and 41061. And these are two critical zero click vulnerabilities known as BlastPass that were actively exploited to deliver the Pegasus spyware. One very important thing to note about these vulnerabilities is the effect that the way um, uh, iPhones and iOS um, in general render images. So iMessage is not the only way that a, a malformed image could be delivered to an iPhone. There's a number of infection methods. Um, and as, as, um, as I say, it's a zero click vulnerability. So um, anything that causes the iPhone to even begin rendering that image triggers the exploit um, and um, of course can lead to, to infection. So this affects pretty much um, all um, Apple mobile devices, um, including iPads, um, Mac's running OS uh, Ventura as well, and Apple Watch. Um, so that, yeah, as I say, this is a uh, um, image rendering vulnerability, and, and that library is used um, across the entire Apple suite of platforms. Um, and this has been known to, um, as I say, lead to the Pegasus spyware, um, which is um, a, a very invasive piece of spyware. Um, and uh, obviously used in very targeted attacks, um, but nevertheless, it's it's very important to, to update um, your devices uh, to the latest iOS version, which is 16.6.1. Um, and for highly vulnerable uh, uh, individuals, uh, very important people, um, they may consider activating lockdown mode on their, um, on their work mobile um, iPhone. Uh, which adds some some extra layers of security um, and disables certain functions, including iMessage attachments and face ID authentication and, and so on and so forth. Uh, but that's uh, for for the uh, risk modelers to, to decide within your organization. And that's all from me this week, Keith. I'll pass it back over to you. Thanks, George. I uh, appreciate it. We'll, we'll turn over to Dave to talk about blister malware. Dave. Thank you. Um, Elastic Security released an article covering updates to the Blister malware. 
This malware is a loader that has seen recently as part of SOC Ghoulish infection chains, mainly used to install the open source C2 post exploitation framework Mythic. Blizzard Loader has very low detection rates, with examples provided by Elastic Security are only um, detected by about one out of 70 antivirus engines. Blizzard obtains these low detection ratings by utilizing a number of techniques. The, the loader will often be encrypted and then encapsulated with inside a logistic application, frequently within a DLL file rather than the main executable. This makes it hard to spot by traditional signature-based AV engines as the encryption reduces the set of possible um, binary signatures and the code surrounding it um, obscures it, its true nature. In an attempt to frustrate EDR and runtime analysis, the malware uses two main techniques, adding long sleep periods into its code paths, which effectively delays suspicious uh, behavior when an EDR opens it in a temporary sandbox before execution, and it attempts to unhook the common instrumentational hooks EDRs attach to running binaries. A recent feature added by the developer is the ability to limit the execution of the malware to machines running on a certain domain. This means the likely design goal of the malware is to be deployed in specific target organizations rather than via generic bulk email or targeting of individual users. Um, Blister as a threat is best countered by educating users to social engineering techniques to avoid the malware entering the environment in the first place. Of note, Scott, Scott Goulish has made frequent use of malvertising as a means of initial infection. As such, user education should include malware ad awareness training and not be limited solely to spotting phishing emails. Thank you, Keith. Thank you, Dave. Appreciate it. I'm going to send it over to Mikesh to talk about Chase Malware. Mikesh. Thank you, Keith. Hello, everyone. So back in January 2023, cybersecurity experts at Morphisec uh, security company discovered a highly sophisticated variant of a malware called Chase. Uh, the variant that they observed was the fourth major iteration of the malware and has evolved significantly, featuring a complete rewrite in, in Python with enhanced communication capabilities and a shift towards targeting high profile, high profile platforms, including banks. Uh, Chase Malware initially appeared back in 2020, focusing on Latin American e-commerce particularly Mercado Libre users. It was known for its multi-stage infection process, data theft capabilities, and the use of various programming language. By Q4 of 2021, Chase's activity intensified and a vast shed of light on its refined infection chain and communication enhancements. Uh, the threat actor known as Lucifer responded cryptically uh, to AFAST's findings back in December 22. Tempest Researchers Group side channels uncovered Chase uses use of WMI for system data collection. The malware's infection chain currently remains consistent with previous versions, beginning with a deceptive MSI installer masquerading as a Java JDE or an antivirus software. Once this is executed, the persistence process, migration, and malicious activities are taken place whilst the malware is downloaded into files into a dedicated folder. The malware compromises of seven distinct modules, each specific functions such as data gathering, victim registration, credential stealing, and file uploads. This version introduces a re-implementation of these modules with improved functionalities. Notably, it displays an interest in cryptocurrency targeting Bitcoin, Ethereum, and MetaMask. Chase also has the ability of obtaining cookies from browsers such as Google Chrome. Chase currently poses a significant threat, especially to businesses in the logistic and financial sectors. Its advanced capabilities, evolving tactics, and specific targeting on high-profile profile platforms and banks necessitates proactive defense. We have currently ingested all IOCs for this variant into MISP and have pushed it out to our detection technologies. We will continue monitoring uh, this malware and other variants of this malware to ensure that the latest detections are pushed out to our clients. Uh, thank you. Uh, back to you, Keith. 
Thanks, Mikesh. Appreciate it. So we're going to follow it up here with a ransomware roundup from Lori. Lori? Thanks, Keith. Yeah, so for today's ransomware roundup, we're looking at a key group ransomware and black cat ransomware. Um, so key group uh, ransomware group, this is a group that first appeared in January uh, 2023. They're believed to be a Russian language uh, operator behind that one. Um, and there's been recent intel that uh, one of their variants has been disrupted by re researchers who were able to uh, basically put together a, a decryptor that victims can use. Um, and this was due to several flaws that they identified in the key group ransomware's uh, cryptography. So if you are you know, seeing a incident or seeing a note related to key group ransomware, that's one um, that everyone should be aware of that there is a publicly available decryptor for that one. Um, and uh, you know, for organizations trying to protect against key group ransomware and other ransomware variants, um, some of the main ways to protect against key group ransomware are by restricting application execution, disabling unnecessary remote desktop protocols, and creating a secure backup plan. We were also looking at Black Cat ransomware and some activity that we've seen uh, coming from them. So Black Cat is a ransomware as a service group that's been active uh, probably for the last year or so. They do use the affiliate model <clears throat> and the affiliates can really kind of <clears throat> have some agency to pick their own targets uh, without kind of oversight from the malware developers. And recently we've seen, um, you know, it's unclear if it's either one affiliate or multiple affiliates, but we have seen them targeting law firms. Uh, particularly, there have been some high profile cases targeting law firms in Australia. Now, law firms, it's not a new thing for ransomware groups to target law firms. Uh, they are very appealing to these groups, likely because of the high uh, volume of confidential information uh, that these groups believe them to have. Uh, it's likely in these cases with Black Hat that they're using initial access brokers to help identify uh, law firms that may have compromised credentials that they can e easily use for access. Uh, just to be aware of with Black Hat, they are one of the groups that uses the what we would call double extortion model. So they do exfiltrate uh, during their attacks, sometimes taking very large uh, volumes of data and then trying to financially extort victims to prevent that data from being posted. Uh, they also have a few other pressure tactics that they use, including uh, DDoS attacks and uh, harassing call centers. And what this means is that they actually have uh, basically fraudulent call centers that they will employ to call employees or customers of their victims, just another method to pressure the main organization into paying that ransom demand. So that's all we have this week for the Ransomware Roundup. I'll hand it over to Keith uh, to see if there's any questions. Thanks, Lori. Uh, and a big thank you to everybody that has taken the time to tune in to Kroll's weekly threat intelligence briefing. We hope the we found the session informative and uh, we hope you enjoy the rest of the day. Make sure you tune in to next week. Take care.